What if you disappeared? Never seen again. For most people, it's a faraway nightmare. But for others, they are confronted with a horrific reality. We were skin diving off the end of the beach, a bit further along, and just a bit of bad luck, the third guy got eaten. Just purely one in a million chance. Every human has fears, and one of the most common is the fear of sharks. Some people say that shark attacks involving humans are supposedly rare, while others say they are more common than you think. And I just saw a big black back of the shark and the fin, um, just the turbulence of him going down, of the shark going down. All I know is that this shark was a massive shark. I saw his hand spear on the bottom, the bloke saying, don't, 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 don't go in there, and he had me by the legs and he wouldn't let me hardly get my head in the water. There, there was no doubt in, in my mind that it was taken by a shark. It all begins on a beautiful summer's day. As the sun was beaming down onto the pristine shores of Tasmania's South Cape Bay, while a group of young friends went spearfishing. But as one member of the group swam quite a far distance from the shore, suddenly he was gone. Fishermen saw a five metre long silhouette near his boat before the line snapped. This is the true story of a 32 year old man named Geert Talon who was killed in a shark attack. I travelled around Tasmania in search of witnesses. I set out to interview people who were present as a frightening historical incident unfolded and spoke with others who were deeply impacted by this Tasmanian tragedy. But this investigation could go deeper than we think. I'm right now in a place called Cockle Creek, the gateway to the World Heritage South Coast walking track. And I'm actually going to be hiking to find a very significant location that was part of this story. On the 27th of February, 1982, Geert Talon and a group of his friends set out on this bushwalk for a camping trip. If someone was just walking down this rocky shore, they would most likely just think it was an ordinary beach. But this is actually the real location of where Geert Talon was taken by a shark, South Cape Bay. Once the group finished their bushwalk, they camped at the South Cape Rivulet. They decided to go spearfishing using some of the equipment they brought along. As they were standing on the rocks, Geert jumped in the water, but one of his friends, Peter Sipkus, walked back to the campsite to prepare lunch, not knowing that Geert was diving to his death. Peter was just 23 years old when it happened. Now, 41 years later, he looked back at what took place on that sunny day in 1982. Well, we decided there's a group of, I think it was nine or 10 of us, to go down to South Cape for the weekend and the weather forecast was looking pretty good. We were planning on going uh, skin diving, catch a few fish etc, a bit of fun in the water but carrying heavy weights three and a half hours we decided actually we'd only take one lot of wetsuit, one wetsuit, one set of weights and other gear with the intention that uh, we would take it in turns. Went for a swim, uh, I in the meantime uh, went off the beach, I uh, went back to the campsite just nearby. It was then that uh, I recall one of the ladies coming uh, pretty emotionally running down towards us saying that uh, Geert had been taken and uh, what had happened is it was Geert's to, to have the use of the wetsuit and the spearfish and he's apparently uh, yeah, was swimming out while others saw it first hand. I didn't actually see the attack first hand but Geert was a fair way out and so the others called him back in and as he was Talking to the others on the rocks, um, they said that this great black mass came up behind Geert and basically just took him down and that's all they really saw. That afternoon, we uh, happened to see some divers in the area, commercial divers that were on the other side of the bay. One of us approached those divers to come over and basically just assist us. And they actually saw the shark. They'd actually seen the shark earlier on in the day, apparently, we found out later. I remember that they said that they could see uh, Geert's spear on the bottom, 
once the news was out, the police will probably want to come down and have a bit of an investigation, have a talk with us. It might sound a little bit cold, but we actually walked up and down the beach half expecting maybe to find the body part or something. Whilst we were expecting the police or someone to turn up, maybe by helicopter, nothing happened. And we waited longer. I think some of the media came down, but no police. We eventually packed up the gear, packed up the tents. I had to, you know, obviously including all gets gear and uh, we walked back out <laughs> so it wasn't quite the weekend that we actually had expected it to be and it was quite an experience Great white sharks, or Carcharidon carcarius, are a species of mackerel shark, and they are notorious for migrating. This is a great white shark jaw, and it's uh, one that I know the fellow that got it from the east coast of Tasmania. He said it was dead and caught up in nets quite a few years ago, back in the day when you could get them. And it was a three and a half metre long great white, and he cut it open, and inside uh, he pulled out the liver, and it was 100 kilograms when he weighed it. Pretty big shark. Look at the size of the tooth, it's about this sort of size. And you compare that to a megalodon, which we know is basically, they call it an extinct great white, but I, I just think it was a great white that grew bigger. And look at the size of that tooth. So the question is, how, how big did a megalodon get? Three times bigger than the biggest one, great white we see now. Just two weeks before Geert's attack, there had been another shark incident involving a diver named Ray Johnson who was bailed up just 10 kilometres away. In this case, it's likely that one single shark was involved in both events. Geert was a friend of mine. He's a, he was a lovely fellow, yeah, a few years older than uh, most, of, most of our circle, a member of our church. and. Um, yeah, we used to get around and do things like camping and fishing and snorkelling and those sorts of things. He worked for, I think it was the customs, federal customs people, while he was working. Yeah, a good guy. Could you tell me about what you were originally doing in South Cape Bay? Well, our church group had gone down, um, I think there was about nine or so of us had gone down to... Um, do some camping uh, and we decided to do a bit of snorkeling as well um, and spear fishing to catch a few fish and maybe find an abalone or two um, yeah so it was, a, it was a social outing can only say what what i've been told so my wife jackie and, and three others actually saw the shark attack they saw the Part of the shark, um, the fin, the tail, the swish of blood has disappeared, and that was the that was all they saw. So we all took a rucksack with camping gear, and we took one set of spearfishing gear. The abalone divers who came to help later on actually did think they saw the shark, and um, they said it was longer than their boat, which I think was at least five metres. Swimming around in a, a wetsuit makes you look much like probably seals and, and maybe other fish in the area. How far out did he snorkel from the shore? Well, there were three of us, of course, who went snorkeling. I, th I think we probably went out no more than about 20 metres. The bottom was probably only five metres deep, close to shore, but it, it dropped away fairly quickly. And when you're snorkeling, you really can't go into very deep water. So, so the thing that really, um, I suppose, would play on my mind or be in my memory is that I think it was first myself that went um, into the water then my brother Phil and then Geert and it could have been any three any one of those three that the shark came across so it was you know pure fortune that both myself and Philip were out of the water and misfortune for Geert that he was in the water at the time. The White Pointer is known around the world as the White Death, although Tasmania has had only three fatalities in 23 years from sharks. But last Saturday there was a sighting at a popular beach not far from Hobart. 32-year-old Gert Talon of Mornington 
went further out than his friends thought safe. Suddenly they saw a fin, a splash, and the water went red. Talon had disappeared. What I remember mostly was I was probably a little bit further out on the point than some of the others, and so I saw what happened. Geert was a little bit further away, uh, further from shore, I guess, than most of the other group had gone, but that wasn't unusual for him. Because I remember we used to go to Seven Mile Beach for, you know, just youth, youth camps or whatever. He would just go for a swim and you'd just see him disappear and you wouldn't know where he was and he'd come back three hours later running down the beach. So he'd had a big swim and a big run. So he was very, very comfortable in the ocean. And this day, yeah, he was just out a little further than the others and uh, they started calling him in. And I don't know why, whether it was because they wanted him to come closer to shore or whether it was because they lost the fish off the rocks because it had been swept off. So I just called him in as well. I just, you know, signalled for him to come in and he looked up and just went like that and then popped his head back down and then I just saw a big black back of the shark and the fin and then um, just the turbulence of him going down, of the shark going down and then I saw blood sort of appear at the top of the, the top of the water. It was very quick. Then of course we saw seagulls coming down, so it was a bit, yeah, it wasn't very nice. So we were just camping, just a bunch of um, young people from the church, having a church, it was just a church group, youth group. Yeah, we just went for a weekend camp, basically. And they had one wetsuit and just one lot of spear fishing because we had to carry it all in. And I know that Git was the last one to go. The others all had had a go and they said to Git, come on, have a go. And I think he was a bit, oh, nah, it's all right. And they went, no, go, go for it. So he did, he went. When I spoke to the media the following day, I think it was, I asked them to make sure that they helped with some of the gear, but they took helicopters down. As far as I know, they didn't help at all with bringing any of the gear back. They were just interested in a story, I think. I think all they found down there was a a uh, broken spear. When did the police arrive to investigate? I don't think the police went down. I think we we got taken back to Dover. The girls got take, of the group got taken back to Dover by the abalone divers in the boat and the guys walked out and we gave our statements at the police station at Dover. So I don't think they... I, well, they may have gone down the next day or that day with the helicopters and I, I don't know, not sure. I have no, no ill feelings towards the shark whatsoever. It was doing what it does in its territory. Um, we were in its territory, or it was in its territory. Um, and yeah, it wasn't malicious, it was just looking for food. It's just uh, as it happens. You know, you, you can't protect yourself forever. For everything around the place, you just can't do that. Good talent was with a group of Christian people and uh, I went over to the entrance, the little um, entrance off South Cape Bay and we were going to have a dive there that day but uh, they walked down the shore. I was talking to Geert Talon and a few other fellas and I said what are you going to do and they said well we're just going to spear a few fish and uh, I said okay well that's good well we'll just put our wetsuits on and leave you with it. So we went across to the other side of the bay and we worked over there. That's when this uh, fella came running along the beach doing a distress signal and I just, uh, so we picked him up off the shore. And he told us that he'd, uh, his mate had been taken by a killer whale. And I said, well, I don't think that's the case because at that particular time in the year, we don't have killer whales down there. There are other places in the world, I think. We had an 18 foot shark cat at the time with uh, my mate, uh, Jeff Harper, and he was my, also my diving companion. And I wanted to get my head down in with so I could actually have a look and see what, see if it was down there or whatever was was left. And uh, I saw his hand spear on the bottom. The bloke saying, "Don't, don't, don't, don't go in there." And he had me by the legs, and he wouldn't let me hardly get my head in the water. After about uh, five minutes, this huge shark came up off the sand edge, just cruised slowly under the boat. I knew how big it was because it was sticking out both ends of the 18-foot shark cat. And it did that uh, three or four times, and then uh, it disappeared. I said, look, we'd better report this to the police. We took, I think, a couple of the women, uh, we took them back to uh, Dover, 
contacted the Nova Police. They were waiting on the jetty for us. And John Sherry was the actual policeman at the time. And as soon as I mentioned it to him, he's running around putting his wetsuit on. I said, what are you doing? He said, uh, well, we've got to go and try and find what's what's happening over there, see? And I said to his wife, I said, well, look, you want to talk a bit of sense into this fella because if he jumps in the water and, and saw what I saw, I said, he's not coming out. I made one statement. I said, before he leaves, make sure his will is fixed. And that was that. I don't know what happened to him after that, but we went home and then they all went on their mad shark hunt the next day and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the, the serious part of this is that um, a lot of things happen. They couldn't find any trace of, of Gert. I would have thought that, uh, that he would have floated to the surface or because sharks really don't like the taste of, of human blood. And I think what, they, what the shark did after they took him, he took and spat him out on the sand edge. Uh, I was just observing, like, and I could see a milky, not, not, didn't look like blood or anything in the water. Uh, and I thought, at the time, I didn't worry about it too much. And then I saw all the birds all fluttering above the water, and they don't u- usually do that until there's either food or, or something there for them to, to have a, a look at. I didn't go back. All the people came around next day with shark hooks and all that sort of stuff, you know, kill this beast and all that sort of thing. But that shark had actually bailed up uh, Ray Johnson a week before. It was exactly the same shark because it had a, a mark, a white mark on it. But uh, anyway, that's um, as far as that goes. Um, I don't uh, have any requirement to go back and swim in that area again because they. <laughs> They're local, and they look after themselves. According to people I've interviewed about Git Talon's attack, Tasmanian police never visited South Cape Bay to investigate the incident. Instead, a news media helicopter arrived to speak with eyewitnesses. To find out more information, I spoke with former Tasmanian police constable John Cherry. I was a police officer up until 2012. Uh, I retired then. I joined the police service in 1974 and served at a variety of stations and areas, predominantly in the south. I was also in the search and rescue land and diving squad and did a little bit of ne- with the negotiators as well. I was stationed at Dover when Geert was taken. Some members of Geert's group actually told you what happened after the event. What did they say? I didn't actually speak to any of the um, party that day, or my recollection is not even the next day. Um, I spoke to one of the abalone divers who was in the area, Jeff Harper. The people who were in Geert's party I arranged for them to be spoken to. I think they were from a church group at Kingston. So they were spoken to by other police officers, and, but we had enough information that day. I arranged for uh, a team of divers and the police vessel vigilant to come down and collect me. And we were intending to go into South Cape Bay and dive the next day. In any sudden death or death in unusual circumstances, police are required to investigate it under the direction of the coroner. Now the coroner has a police officer generally working directly for him or her. It would be fair to say it was a pretty straightforward investigation. I would have prepared the report. I would have sent the file or a copy of the, the file with my um, questions to Kingston Police Station and a police officer from there would have interviewed the witnesses. I believe we took photos of the area where Geert was taken. The fire would then have gone back and the coroner would have made a decision whether or not to have witnesses attend the court or whether they would just accept the declaration um, and the cause of death was down to a shark attack. I may have had a 
telephone conversation with some of the Geertz party or Geertz group. Yeah, but I can't recall whether or not I spoke to any of them personally at that time. Were you scared at all going diving to find the shark? And did you decide to do it in the end? Was I scared? Yeah, to be honest, yeah, scared, yes, apprehensive, certainly. But um, to dive in an area where you knew that a, a shark had taken a, uh, a person, yeah, it wasn't something that I was looking forward to. No. James Misson warned you not to dive in South Cape Bay because of the shark. What actually happened? I don't recall speaking to James, but the information certainly was coming back. It might have been sort of second or third hand that we would have been at some risk diving in, an, in that area. I don't remember speaking to James, but I remember receiving some information and there was some discussion with the fellow divers and also the the officer in charge of search and rescue at the time, whether or not we should actually get in the water. It was pretty much left to us and we had decided that we would, we would go in the water if we were able to get in. The fact that he was spearfishing, uh, the fact that someone else had been in the water prior to get and it all had speared fish and was cleaning fish, I believe that may have attracted the shark into the area. And since we've spoke to Jeff, we later learnt that another diver, a bloke by the name of Ray Johnson, who was an experienced diver, had seen a shark in that area sometime earlier. Geert was in, unfortunately, in the wrong place at the wrong time. He didn't do anything wrong. I've been to that area several times before. I had actually swam in exactly the same spot several times. The police launched vigilant left Hobart but soon found herself punching against 40 knot headwinds. Finally the 10 metre swells just proved too much and she had to shelter in Research Bay, unable to get here. The conditions were simply too rough for divers to go in over the side. Media helicopters arrived at the scene the following morning. When did police actually investigate? We couldn't get to the area by boat because of the weather. The skipper of the vigilant made the decision was too, too rough. Uh, in any event, it would have been too dangerous to put divers in the water. I remember walking in and searching the area at least twice over, over a week to 10 days. I don't recall exactly when we got to the area. I know the vigilant did conduct a search. Did you go through any process to verify that Geert was actually killed by a shark? Yes, we did, but the process involved interviewing everyone who was there and the witnesses in relation to having seen the shark and the eyewitnesses' account were... There, there was no doubt in, in my mind that um, Geert was taken by a shark. It would have been traumatic for the people, his friends on the beach. It would have been very distressing for his family. Um, personally, I think that um, he wouldn't have known anything about it. He wouldn't have had any warning. It would have been very quick. It would, he wouldn't have known what, what had happened. The shocking death of Geert Talon struck fear into many people's hearts. It severely impacted the abalone divers on Tasmania's south coast, who earned their wages by diving in the very waters where it all occurred. Diver Ray Johnson was bailed up by a white pointer only 10 kilometres away two weeks before. Both events were thought to be associated with one great white shark. This was a direct threat to the livelihoods of divers in the area but locals had found a solution to this problem. Queensland shark hunter Vic Hislop soon flew to Hobart in hopes of killing the shark responsible. One local stated, no one is diving at the moment, but they know they have to go back to work sometime. 
We are all hoping that Vic Hislop can get the shark for us. Some people feared that this hunt would lead to a wasteful slaughter of many great white sharks. In return for donating his services, he would keep the jaws of the shark once he had killed it. This was the last shark hunt in Tasmanian history, and it failed. Tasmanian author, natural historian and shark advocate Chris Black informed me of the outcome of this legendary hunt. Only two weeks prior, Ray Johnson was bailed up by a great white just 10 kilometres away. Could that have been the same shark? I believe it possibly was. Now that's not to say there couldn't be a number of that size white shark operating in those waters at that time. There is plenty of offshore reefs laden with prey. It's a spot that a white shark would be very comfortable in and it would pay it to be there. It's circled him a number of times, kept him on the bottom and kept him from getting to his boat um, until he finally did make a break for it. Given that it was only, I think it was around 10 kilometres as a crow flies from the site of the South Cape Bay incident, it's quite likely that it was the same shark, I believe, just from that perspective. We should add to that that the Abalone fraternity are quite close-knit, of course, and they speak to each other. When Ray's story came out, he described a particular pattern of scarring on that shark. In particular, a rectangular white discoloration of its hide on the dorsal surface back towards its tail. When the two abalone dives in South Cape Bay went over to assist in the Gert Talon incident, when the shark swam beneath their shark cat boat, they noticed very obvious scarring and they immediately said, that's the shark that bailed up Ray Johnson. Scarring on white sharks is not unusual. Some of them are very heavily scarred, but that particular scar pattern towards the tail suggests to me that it possibly was the same shark. Soon after Geert's incident, Vic Hislop, shark hunter from Queensland, came down to Tassie. What was the outcome? The outcome was disappointment for Vic, I'm happy to say. I can't hide that. Vic Hislop, for those who don't know, um, was he branded himself the shark man. He made a living, essentially, by killing big sharks in the 1970s and into the 80s, all around Australia, usually in the wake of a, a shark so-called attack. He was high-profile shark hunter. He liked hunting sharks. And he had a shark show. He had a book out. Uh, so all of this stuff would go to promoting him and his business, essentially. He would offer his services as some kind of a vengeful um, hunter who will get the shark that that you know maimed or injured a per or killed a person and remove it from the water because he thought that or he claimed that that would then keep people safe and that's a nonsense for a start what what did he plan to do just kill a whole bunch of sharks and hope that one of them was the shark that was responsible now Vic Hislop I would say suffered from what I'd call the quint syndrome quint being the shark hunting character in the film Jaws mm -hmm. And I'm sure Vic Hislop was more than influenced by Jaws. Uh, he seemed to take on that mantle of shark killer um, very enthusiastically. And again, I stress, it's not that we shouldn't enter the shark's domain, but we should be careful and alert and should always accept the, our responsibility. The shark isn't coming into our environment to hurt us. So as far as Vic Hislop goes, I'm glad he failed. And I thought he would, because simply the chances of finding that shark would have been very very slim, I would suggest, let alone the build, the seas that built up in the weeks, days and weeks following meant that their shark hunt was, was doomed from the start. The spectacle of people rushing out in boats armed to the teeth to try and kill a single shark just started to seem slightly ludicrous to a lot of people. And a shark's got to eat just like we do. And unfortunately, if a human ends up as part of its diet, it again is just bad luck, really bad luck. We know now through scientific tagging, satellite tagging and so forth. Migrations and navigational abilities of white sharks are amazing. They travel all over the globe. Gert and his friends were spearfishing at the time 
and speared fish in the water is a signal to any self-respecting hunting shark cruising around. They'll feel the low frequency drumming of a fish on the end of a spear, for example, or they will uh, catch the scent of fish blood as well. Water uses in wetsuits, it increases their appearance of a seal at the surface, like a black neoprene wetsuit you can imagine. This happened barely 50 metres, I think it was, from the outflow of the South Cape Rivulet. Now that's a freshwater source coming into the Southern Ocean. A lot of sharks will tend to go into seawater that is diluted by freshwater because it can help remove the parasites that annoy them in their daily life. I've also read that shark incidents usually occur in winter time. Was it unusual at all that Git Talon's attack occurred in the summer? Many white sharks have been captured in Tasmanian waters in the winter months and in fact a number of the human shark interactions, fatal or otherwise, uh, have occurred in winter. It's around winter time when fur seal pups are taken to the water on their own for the first time to hunt, therefore they're inexperienced. Now of course after eons of interaction between these two species, a prey and its predator, sharks have come to know these rhythms of the seals and therefore they are in our waters in winter time for just that reason. Gert's uh, incident was of course uh, in the height of summer, but that is not unusual either because in terms of sheer numbers of sharks, there are probably more sharks in summer of many species. Makos come into our waters during those months and stay until around autumn time. What is interesting about Gert's is that it was a very large shark from all accounts. Um, we're probably talking around a six metre shark, almost as big as a white pointer will get. If a great white's lifespan is up to 70 years, could it mean the shark that killed Git Talon is still lurking today? It's possible. Now if that shark was six metres and given that there are very, very few accounts worldwide of a white shark larger than six metres, um, you would have to say that that shark was probably getting on. Yeah, the chances of her still being around might be unlikely, I would suggest. A party of hikers from a church group in Hobart were taking turns with skin diving gear. 32 year old Gert Taylor of Mornington went further out than his friends thought safe. It was pretty traumatic to lose a friend, so in those first few weeks that was certainly the emotion. And after that, yeah, we did miss having Gert's company. Uh, we used to meet at his place quite a bit uh, for social activities. Um, and of course that was all over. It's not something that sort of I dwell on, the attack. I mean at the time it was certainly very dramatic. It was dramatic actually coming home as a group and having to not just inform family <laughs> but tell others what actually happened and having to re-describe it over and over again to a whole lot of different people. I think the hardest part for me was probably packing up Geert's tent and packing up his belongings and then carrying it all out. That's where the reality was. I was relatively at peace about the whole thing because uh, Geert did actually have a faith and uh, he knew where he was going. I think as a, as a church at that time it was, a, it was a difficult time but it was also a good opportunity to to grieve together. Life can be short, can be unexpected. We don't, none of us know where we're going to be tomorrow. He got taken by a shark. We saw him go down, he didn't come up. He's, he's gone. So if there's any chance of him still being alive, we'd still be out there, mate, don't you worry. But there's not. not on. He was instantly gone. I'm not sure how I actually got to to get it. I think it was just when he passed away, his mum invited us, I think, around to maybe just, you know, if there was anything that we wanted to remember him by. And I guess I thought the suitcase was pretty cool, a little bit special. Yeah. It was also a blessing that when this happened, that Geert had got a lift with somebody else down to the car park at Cockle Creek. So that's where we walked in from. But nobody had to drive his car home because that would have been a very confronting thing to have to do after what we just witnessed. So I always thank God for that little blessing. The waves were huge and thunderous. I think it was a seven metre swell and coming off the ocean. And it certainly gave me a real sense of, it's in some senses a lonely spot, of course, as you can imagine, it's remote on the coast, 
but wild. It has a total wildness about it. It feels like a place that's pregnant with possibility for anything to happen. Geert's talon was taken in a glimpse, faster than anyone could ever imagine. When uncovering this tragedy, friends of Geert's told me his story. Some people say no one lives forever, but sometimes their story does. Something incredibly surprising to me is that the name Geertz means to be strong or brave with a spear. He embodied just that.